morning, my fellow hunters. This is Rick Crawford with the Wildlife Hour. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the upcoming draw results for the Utah big game hunts. Within just a couple of weeks, uh, there's going to be a few hunters that are going to be very happy about the draw results and a lot of hunters that are feeling down on their luck. That's just part of the big game hunting draw every year across every state. Almost all the western states are now in a draw system. There are still a few hunts over the counter, but, but mighty few. Um, and what I want to talk about today is for those successful hunters, are you prepared to be successful? with your coveted limited entry tag that you have drawn. Whether you draw once in a lifetime species uh, or a, an elk or a mule deer permit or any other permit that you draw, are you prepared to do what it takes to have success? You've put in for this hunt for many years. You've spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort researching. And now that you have this tag in hand, are you going to be successful? Um, if you have failed to plan, then you're basically planning to fail. Uh, it's hard for me to feel sympathy for people that have been putting in for a limited entry hunt for 15 or even 20 years and they suddenly draw the tag and then two weeks before the hunt starts or even a month or two months or even three months they call me on the telephone and are either wanting to ask advice about the unit that they've they've drawn and are going to be hunting or perhaps they even want to hire me to guide them. And as many times as I can, I will accommodate them and help them. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, you know, the chances of this person having uh, great success have gone down dramatically because this tells me several things. First of all, it says that there's a good likelihood they're not going to be in very good shape. There's a good likelihood that their weapon is not going to be ready to go or they're not going to be real familiar with their weapon. Um, it, it, there's a good chance that they're not going to be prepared mentally for this hunt. And now they're either going to throw it all on me by hiring me, trying to hire me as a guide or an outfitter but they're not prepared themselves. And so I may not be able to physically get them into the area where the, the desert bighorn sheep or the giant bull elk or the non-typical buck is located. Um, and if you have years and years and years to plan for a limited entry hunt, you should be doing everything in your power to stay up with the unit that you're planning to hunt or researching the different units. You should be spending other time fishing, hunting, hiking, or exploring in those areas, in those units, every chance you get. And you should be keeping yourself in physical condition. And you should be ultimate, intimately familiar with the weapon that you plan to hunt with. You know, a lot of people, when they show up to hunt on these limited entry hunts, they, I see them get out of their vehicle and, and unload their gear, and I can tell immediately whether they're going to be able to shoot their gun or whether they're ready to go, just by the, the way their equipment's put together and by the looks of their equipment. If I see a beat-up old gun that's yet well oiled and cared for, I get a lot more excited than when I see that $10,000 custom long range shooting rifle 
with a Zeiss or a Swarovski scope that doesn't have a scratch on it come out of the case. You know, I can tell that that, that new weapon hasn't had, you know, 20 rounds put through it. And, and then I see them, rev or I see somebody reverently holding an old gun that has obviously been shot thousands and thousands of time, times. And the hunter's well conditioned, he, he's in good shape, he's bright eyed and bushy tailed, he's ready to go. I get a lot more excited about that than I do with somebody shows up with a completely new outfit, brand new gun, and, and I think you can see the obvious implications behind what I'm saying. I guess is once you draw that tag you have two questions. Am I going to do a do-it-yourself hunt type of hunt? Or am I going to hire an outfitter? And if you have prepared yourself by going by learning the unit, scouting the unit with other hunts, fishing trips, hiking trips, and you have paid attention and talked to people, and you know where other people have killed big animals in the unit, you know the access routes, the, the water um, holes and wallows, or you understand the animal, that, the habits of these animals, for instance, bull elk, the difference between where their summer grounds are and where their rutting areas are. Uh, with a big mule deer buck, you, you, you know there's some big, big mule deer in the area. And you have a technique, a planned technique. A, a, you have a, a style that you know or understand or have had success with in the past that you're planning to use on these hunts or on these particular animals. Uh, even if you have spent a lot of time on the unit and you have kept yourself in good shape, you're familiar with your weapon, you can shoot 600 yards or 60 yards with your rifle. You know, that's one question I get asked all the time. I mean, almost to a... I don't think people think about their questions sometimes before they ask. But I get people that'll say, well, what's the shot selection like? How far are we going to be shooting? And I don't want to be ignorant, but I'm not Nostradamus. And there isn't one unit or one animal species in Utah that you cannot shoot 600 yards plus or end up shooting 64 yards or 60 yards. Even 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 uh, pronghorn antelope or bighorn sheep, you know, you better be proficient. You better be able to get up, get your sight target in your scope or your bow sights and get your shot off in a timely manner when the animal presents an ethical killing shot. You also need to know you understand your own limits and your own abilities. I would much rather see somebody pass up a 60-yard archery shot and, and, and miss out on the opportunity than to take a shot that they haven't practiced and they can't make most of the time and wound the animal and spend half the hunt trying to ethically finish an animal off or lose an animal. And so all these things come into play. Uh, but no matter whether you do it yourself or whether you hire an outfitter, there are certain things that you have to be able to do to be successful on a hunt. And, and those are weapon familiarity. You need to be familiar with your weapon. You need to be proficient with it. You need to shoot it regularly and be able to get on your target and make your shots. You know, you see hunters, I see it all the time. They get their gun up and they can't find the animal, the animal in their scope. Or they're struggling with their bow with some kind of equipment or something. And it just, it's frustrating and it's hard. And there's the animal standing there broadside, the perfect shot. I could have shot it 15 times and then it wanders off or goes behind the tree or out of range. And 
I would suggest to every hunter out there, not just big game hunters, but, but shooters and hunters, to get out with your, your favorite weapon, the weapon of choice that you're going to be using on your hunts, and go jackrabbit hunting. Go into the pinions, into the sagebrush, into the into the rugged country where there's a where there's a population of jackrabbits, and sneak around and jump shoot and and target shoot jackrabbits. You'll learn to get on the target quickly. You'll be able. You'll learn to make some running shots. You'll learn to, what shots are you can make and what shots you cannot make and you will also learn familiarity and safety with your weapon. You'll be able to practice those things. Um, always practice safety but when, you be, when you're familiar with your weapon and you use your weapon then when you're on a hunt where things count, where it really matters everything will be automatic. You'll be safe. You'll be prepared to shoot. You'll be able to get on target. You'll be able to make your shots. And if you can shoot a jackrabbit at 60, 100, or 200 yards, I can guarantee you you're going to make your shots on your mule deer or your pronghorn or your desert sheep. And definitely going to make your shots on your bull elk or your, your, your big bull moose. Um, the confidence will be there and you won't have to second guess yourself. And that's what it's all about. That's the thing I see the most in today's hunting world. We have all the latest and greatest toys and tools, uh, uh, hunting clothing and gear. We can get all excited about that, but we just don't spend the time in the field. We just don't get in shape physically. We just don't spend the time shooting, target practicing, and actually hunting other small game and things with the same weapon we're going to be use, using so that we are proficient, accurate, and um, ethical with our with our shots. Um, I'm look at some of my notes here. Some of the questions that you can ask yourself, am I in shape? Can I shoot? Do I have someone to help me? Not just for companionship, uh, but safety. To be able to help you pack an animal out and be ethical with the preservation of your trophy. A lot of these Utah hunts are conducted during the time of year when it can be very warm outside. Your archery hunts start in mid-August. Even your elk hunts in October can be very warm. And so you need to be able to get your game packed out in a timely manner. The meat taken care of, your cape and your head taken care of. Get your animals tagged and safely out of the field. Um, do I know where to hunt in my unit? Do I know how to hunt? If you're going to do a do-it-yourself hunt, are you willing to put in the time necessary? Have you put in the time necessary in the, in the years before you drew your permit? Are you going to be able to put in the time necessary on the year that you have drawn your tag? Because things change on these units. Animals change. Um, that trophy bull that you've been watching the last three or four years may have been harvested or died on the winter range. Um, and so if you don't actually get on the unit physically on the year that, that you are planning to hunt, get some trail cameras out, spend some time glassing, spend some time in the woods, verifying that the animals are there, uh, you're going to have a tough hunt. It's gonna, and, and, and you're going to leave your hunt to chance and circumstance, to, to, to luck, rather than to actual um, effort, skill, and hard work. And I see very few trophies. When you look at the magazines and you look at the, the, the true trophies that are taken, there's usually a big backstory behind every one of them. And if you're going to hire an outfitter, do some research. Get a top outfitter with a proven track record. Find the best outfitter for the location that you have chosen. Um, you know, there's a lot of great outfitters in the state of Utah. And some of them are going to be unit-specific outfitters. 
some of them are going to be big outfitters and they've had a lot of experience in many areas of the state but you're going to do a lot better with an outfitter that has focused on a specific area kept track of the animals that are in that area knows the area if he lives close to the area or how intimately is he familiar with that and what's his track record and then the other thing is, is who's he going to give you for a guide? Is he going to give you an experienced, knowledgeable guide? Is he going to guide you himself? Or are you, you know, the fifth man on the list that has this unit and you're going to get the young, inexperienced guide? Those are all questions that you, you need to be aware of and, and talk to your outfitter about. And if you're smart, if you've done your planning and your research and you've picked a guide, you should have picked a guide long before and be working with him on what units to be putting in for, what to be doing to, to get ready. Um, and so he knows you and he's been thinking about you and he's been planning, he knows what kind of an animal you're after, he knows what kind of condition you're in, what your age is, what your limitations are. Then it, then he has things set aside for you. He's got things in the back of his mind that he's, he, he knows that he, he can get you on and he can help you to be successful. And then if you will do your part and be prepared mentally, physically, and, and, and with your weapon and your equipment, then your chances of a successful, very successful hunt are off the chart compared with the rest of the hunters that are out there. Now everybody knows of that lucky guy that stumbled into the woods, never been in the unit before, didn't plan his hunt, was broke as heck, and goes out and shoots a 370, 380 bull driving down the road. I mean, it happens. That's, that's part of hunting, chance and circumstance. But that's not the norm. You're going to find a lot more hunters that are planned and prepared and ready to hunt, those are the hunters that kill the majority of your trophy animals with these limited entry hunting units. And most of them have hired guides and outfitters. And because most people in today's world just cannot afford the time and the, and the ability to take time off work to go do the scouting and do the things that's needed to truly find these big animals and keep track of them. Cut. My dog's barking in the background. I'm going to have to back up. I'm Rick Crawford, and I'm here talking today about the Utah Big Game Hunting Draw, which is coming up here later in May. And we're talking about being prepared for the hunt and whether to hire an outfitter or do it yourself. We do have the, the once in a lifetime hunts and we have the limited entry deer and elk hunts and pronghorn and everything else but pretty much these limited entry hunts are almost turning into a, a once in a lifetime deal as well. Um, by the time you Unless you're extremely lucky, by the time you draw one of these limited entry tags, depending on the unit, um, you're looking at anywhere from, from, from 12 to 20 years, somewhere in that area, depending on your unit, depending on whether you go archery, muzzleloader, or rifle hunting, and depending on whether you're putting in for the very top premium unit for that species, um, this could be a once-in-a-lifetime hunt for you. Of course, depending on your age and, and when you entered in the draw, and whether or not you're going to, after you've drawn elk, for instance, you're now going to put in for mule deer or pronghorn or whatever it is you're doing, that elk hunt or that mule deer hunt, that pronghorn hunt in Utah could be a once-in-a-lifetime adventure. Um, and so, if you don't make the most of it, when you have that tag in your hand, you're always going to have regrets. And 
I don't know anybody that's had regrets on their hunt if they've poured their heart and soul into it and hunted as hard as they can and done everything in their power to be successful. They usually are. And even the few that are not, they have those memories, photographs, video, to last a lifetime, and they know they did the best they can with what they had. Now, if you hire an outfitter for one of these limited entry hunting units, your odds are going to go way up if you've hired a, a quality outfitter. Your odds are going to go way up. Um, I don't want to brag, but my, my odds on these limited entry units are hovering right close to 100%. Um, but we get out and we scout hard, we hunt hard, we know where the animals are. And if you're in shape, if you can make your shots, if you listen to instructions and do what you're told, you're going to have success. That's all there is to it. Um, you know, these limited entry hunts are expensive. It takes a lot of work, a lot of scouting, a lot of effort, a lot of expertise from a guide and an outfitter to, to put on a successful hunt for a trophy animal. And people don't realize that your success is our success as well. If you're not prepared, if you're not in shape, if you can't make your shots, then you, then you also hurt our business. And so, you know, people complain about the price or this or that or the other, but we do everything in our power to be successful because that big bull or big buck or, that you harvest sells more hunts for us. And if you draw a limited entry tag, and then you can't physically participate at the level that you need to, then your size, quality, and experience is going to go down. It's going to be a lot more difficult for you to have a good hunt, have a, have a good time, and, and to kill a real quality animal. Now, I just want to do a little bit of math for people here. Um, let's say your limited entry deer or elk hunt for a premium unit is around $6,500 for a seven day or nine day hunt, whichever your outfitter puts on. Um, we like to do a nine day hunt to facilitate every bit of success that we can. We want you to be successful and kill the biggest animals that we have. Um, so let's say $6,500 and let's say that you're Trying to, trying to draw an elk tag, a premium elk tag. And let's say you're an archery hunter, which is probably the easiest tag to draw as a, as a Utah resident for premium elk. And let's say that it takes you 12 years to draw that tag. 12 to 14 years. Um, probably closer to 14 on, a, on the better units as a resident. Um, and you're gonna, it's, and it's going to cost you sixty-five hundred dollars. Well, if we divide sixty-five hundred by fourteen, you need to save four hundred and sixty-four dollars, four hundred and sixty-four dollars a year. If you if you know that it's going to be difficult for you to come up with the money, then you need to have a savings account and put four hundred and sixty-four dollars a year into it. Divided by 12, that's $38.69, pretty much 39 bucks, 40 bucks a month. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people spend 40 bucks a month on, on soda or something. I mean, we certainly waste a lot of money every month on things that um, we don't really need that that we could easily save 38 bucks a month. But even in a, even in a shorter term, you know, that's, that's a long time to, to be saving and I can see that account being robbed by your wife or by necessity quite a few times. But, you know, if you adequately plan ahead and have a specific account, if you, if you know it's gonna be hard for you to come up with the money, you're gonna be well, it's gonna be well worth it to you as far as the quality of your hunt and your experience if you hire an outfitter. Not only are you going to get professional help, you're going to have 
professional scouting, your hunt's going to be a lot safer. You're going to be able to focus on getting yourself in shape and being familiar with your weapon and, and not have to worry about taking a whole bunch of time off of work and driving to your unit and and you're, so in reality the amount of time that you need to put into in scouting and in the years leading up to your hunt is going to cost you as much if not more to be prepared for your hunt if you if you do it right as a do-it-yourself hunter it's going to cost you every bit as much as it is if you hire an outfitter for one of these limited entry hunts. But maybe that's your thing. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, if that's your thing, if you want to be prepared, you want to spend the time and you have the ability to do that, that's great. But for most guys, and, and what I see happening is they don't worry about it until it gets close to where they're getting max bonus points or they feel like they're going to draw and then they start trying to do something and you know worst case scenario is that you are faced with the dilemma of being lucky and you draw early you draw within half the time it usually takes and you're totally unprepared you don't have the money you don't have the time to put into scouting and then all of a sudden there you are with a tag and you're trying to decide whether to turn it back in or to take the hunt and so you know you're going to be a lot better off if you're just going to buy bonus points if you're if you're not then you are going to be if you're unprepared that's just my opinion you might as well let somebody who who's ready and willing and able to hunt hunt and get yourself prepared um, now it's going to be pretty hard if if you don't have any bonus points or don't have very many bonus points and, and a lot of guys are just going to go and they may have some success they may not but then you got a five-year waiting period before you can start over again and so all of a sudden that five years that you put in is gone you didn't get an animal or you got an animal you regretted and now you got five more years, so now you've got ten years before you can start putting in again. And then you start putting in again, and then the odds are you're not going to be that lucky again. And so then you've got another 12 to 15 years added on top of that. So, I mean, we cause ourselves a lot of pain and misfortune by, by not being prepared uh, physically and uh, financially and in every other way. So I'm just trying to get guys to start thinking about the quality of their hunt. They draw a quality hunt. You need to be match the quality of your hunt with your own conditioning, your own abilities, your own preparedness, and you will have a great and memorable hunt. Um, diet and physical conditioning are becoming more and more of an issue on on these hunts I see every year that I have more and more hunters that are packing extra weight are out of breath um, they're not as familiar with their weapon as they should be and really there there's no excuse for it if, if you're gonna be a hunter and you want to have some success then you should get, keep yourself in good physical shape, but not only for your health and for your benefit and well for your family and your life and your, your work, your business, um, but be able to participate in these things at the level that you need in order to be successful. Um, I've talked to a lot of hunters on the phone that can talk a really good talk and they may have killed some great animals and then they show up in camp and they are 100 pounds overweight and they're affected by the elevation and I'm concerned about their health and their safety and I you know I'm trying then all of a sudden my game plan has to change I'm, I'm sitting there trying to figure out how I'm gonna hunt this guy how am I gonna get him to where I know these trophy animals are that we've been scouting all summer long and then I'm concerned about safety and I'm in the back of my mind I'm thinking about what are we going to have to do to get if there's an emergency if he has heart problems or 
uh, elevation sickness. And so these are all things that, uh, that out, outfitters think about and we're concerned about. It doesn't matter how good of a hunt we put on, if, if somebody doesn't come back home, that, that's not a good outcome. And so there's a lot of things that, that hunters can do uh, to be successful. And the biggest one is their personal physical condition, their conditioning, get an exercise program, try to eat right, um, be very familiar and safe with your hunting weapon, be very proficient, know your limitations, be able to get on the animal quickly, be prepared for that good clean ethical shot, listen to your outfitter. I know a lot of times I've talk to guys on the phone and they ask me questions. They'll say, I'm going to get a new pair of boots or I'm going to get some new camo or I'm going to do this or that for this hunt and I would like for your recommendations. And so I take my time and my effort and, you know, give them some recommendations, give them, give them some specifics about what works best for where we're at. And then they show up and they're in something totally different than what we talked about or, um, you know, when I, it, I'm, what I'm saying is those are the small things that we look for and we realize in a hurry whether a guy is going to listen to us in the field. If he's going to respond to the things we say, then we know he's going to be safe. We know he's going to be able to have an opportunity to kill the, the, the animal that we're hunting. Um, because we know that he's listened, or if we see that the things that we talked about are not the same, he hasn't represented himself truthfully, he hasn't followed our recommendations, then, it's, then we're going to start questioning our own game plan. We're going to be, start going to be worried about safety, we're going to be worried about whether I tell this guy to do something or put him here, if he's going to be here when I get back, running over to glass on this next ridge while we while he watches this canyon, um, there's a lot of things that that we can do to multiply our odds and a lot of things we can do to be successful, but if we're unsure about what the client is going to do, if, if, we're, if we're not positive that he's going to listen to us, then we can't do the things that we need to to be 100% successful. And I can, I can say honestly that all the clients that I've ever had a bad relationship with or a bad experience with, it was because of one or two things. Either they came to camp so in such bad physical shape that they could not physically hunt, or they did not listen to the things that I asked them to do. They would not respond to the things that I asked them to do. And those two things um, make it really tough to be successful. And it, it, it's so, and so hunters, it's really important if you're going to hire a guide that you listen to them, that you get yourself prepared because we can't do that for you. you there are certain things you have to do for yourself. And if you're not prepared physically, mentally, you're not familiar with your weapon, with your equipment, with your gear, you don't have the things that we asked you to bring on your equipment list, um, it's, it can be difficult. And um, on the other hand, if you have the right equipment, you're prepared, you're in physical shape, the outfitter now has confidence in you, you have confidence in him, you're going to have a great hunt. And, and so um, these are just some of the things to think about as you check the mail, check your credit cards, check to see if you've been successful. Are you prepared? Have you prepared to succeed or are you, if you've not, if you failed to plan, then you're really planning to fail.
Hi, I'm Rick Crawford. I'm here with the Wildlife Hour. Um, I'm the owner and operator of Record Book Outfitter. And I'm here today to talk about the upcoming 2017 Utah Limited Entry Draw. The results are coming out here uh, mid uh, to the end of May. And there's going to be a lot of happy hunters, a lot of a lot more that are going to be down on their luck. But if you are one of the few lucky ones to draw your limited entry permit for 2017, the last thing you want to do is be unprepared for your hunt. And so I'm going to do a fun little thing right now just to give some examples of things that you can do, things that you should have to be successful if you're going to do a do-it-yourself hunt or even if you're going to hire an outfitter to help you and um, in this little segment I'm going to call does your equipment look like this and um, believe it or not in all these examples I'm going to show you I have had hunters show up with far worse examples and 90% 90, 90 of the time the individuals that show up unprepared or have the wrong equipment they're not people that are down on their luck that can't afford equipment or gear most of them are relatively wealthy by far more wealthy than I am and are usually it's, it, it could be a lifestyle maybe they're a cowboy and they want to wear cowboy boots or a hat or whatever but these are just some of the examples of things that I have seen. Um, talk about optics. Do your binoculars look like this? Or like this? Does your hunting belt look like this? Or like this? Does your skinning knife look like this? Or like this? This thing weighs about three pounds. And it's a nice knife. It's a Damascus steel. It's, it's a beautiful knife, but if you're getting the gist of what I'm... Does your spotting scope Look like this? Or did you even bring a spotting skull? I get a lot of guys that show up and they say, Oh man, I got a really nice Swarovski spotting scope. And the man, that thing, you can look at the moon with it. Ah, I didn't want to bring it because it, ah, I figured it would be too much to carry or too much weight. And I'm just sitting there going, you spent $6,500 booking a hunt. It took you 17 years to draw the tag. And you're going to come without a spotting scope? I can give as an outfitter, I can give 100% while I'm out there spotting. And if you can give me only 10% more, that's 110%. If you can give me 50% more, that's 150%. I get, sometimes I've had sheep hunters that show up on a mule deer hunt, and they can give me 100% too. Those guys are good spotters. And when, and when that happens, your odds when you're spotting and stocking go way up on whatever it is you're hunting. You know, do they show up with the, with the GPS? And extra batteries and or a compass if you tell them you know bring you you know GPS's can break down I've had this I've sent this this is a good little Garmin Rhino I've sent this thing back to the factory twice to have it fixed because once I fell on a lion hunt and damaged it another time it just some of the electronics went kapooey what if something happens to your your outfitter he gets injured and you gotta find your way out and he's trying to give you directions or help you you know, if he tells you to bring something, and even if you're on, or if you're doing your own hunt, you need to be prepared to know how to use 
the equipment that you have. What about what about your uh, headlamp? You show up with this, you know, the out, or, or does the outfitter, you know, you, I get up clients. I say, did you bring a headlamp? Oh yeah, I got one, and they take it out and turn it on, and, no, and nothing. I say, do you have any extra batteries? Oh, oh no, I don't. I don't have any extra batteries. Well, I always have two headlamps, and I always have extra batteries, and I usually have batteries for my clients too. But I've had I've had clients show up with this and pull this out of their backpack. You know, I guess they're figuring that if if a grizzly bear attacks them, they can stick it in his mouth like that. You know. Um, they wonder why at the end of the day they're so worn out. You know when you sh you show up with a, and you have a sharpening stone, is it something like this? You can take this, these blades are replaceable, but you can also sharpen them. This thing weighs about an ounce. It's got a good sharpener. Or do you, I've seen clients pull something like this out of their pack or out of the truck to put in their pack. And I, uh, um, Let's go on to some hunting weapons and some of the things about hunting weapons. When you consult with your outfitter or if you're a do-it-yourselfer, one of the things that you, first thing you should consider is you should match, if you're a rifle hunter, you should match your weapon to your species of animal that you're hunting. Um, and for instance, let's get, go into elk or sheep. Where you need a, a, you could use a long, flat shooting, hard hitting gun. Go with the caliber your outfitter recommends if you have a choice. And if not, list to your outfitter the guns that you do have and let, let him help you choose the caliber, the bullet type that's going to work best for your situation. Are you going to be in heavy, thick country? Is there a lot of rain? Uh, are you going to be shooting long distances? Is, are your. I mean, on our limited entry elk hunts, you can go on a limited entry elk hunt here in Utah, and the bulls, the big mature bulls, are going to be 800 to 1,000 pounds. And you go on some of these hunts in some other places, I've seen a lot of the bulls are killing in some of these other states, and those bulls are topping out at 600 pounds. So you might be able to get away with a 7mm08 or a, you know, a 30 odd 6 on those smaller bulls, but in Utah, on these limited entry bull hunts, I'm recommending a minimum of 7mm Remington Mag. The other thing, did you notice a difference between these two guns I just held up? This is this is getting my paint job's getting a little worn off here, but if you look at this gun, I put a aftermarket stock on it. I put a camo job on there that's fading away, but you can tell this gun's been heavily used. Even though I'm a I'm a bow hunter, paint jobs about wore off this gun. Now this 7mm08 is a sweet little gun, a little stainless. It's got a nice laminated stock. A nice Leopold scope, but what do you notice about this? You can see this gun from a half mile to a mile away if the sun hits it. You got a shiny stock; it's highly polished. This this is a, not a mat. This is a a, a a shiny metal black. You've got stainless colored stock. You can see this gun. An animal could see this gun hit the sunlight at over a mile away. And even though it's a sweet shooting little gun, it's a light little gun, if this is a gun you're going to be using, for instance you're hunting mule deer or you're a light frame hunter, do something with this gun. You know, put a camouflage, removable camouflage um, paint on it, put a flat black, you know, Something that you can remove if that if that's really important to you, if having a nice looking gun like this in your gun gun cabinet or safe, you can clean it up. But I would recommend to people that when they get their hunting guns, 
If you want a gun to look at, have a gun to look at, but if you want a hunting gun, get it so that it's ready to go hunting. Here's another example with, a, with bows. I can tell when a client steps out of the vehicle and, and I see his bow, she shows me what his bow is, whether he's, gonna, whether he's ready to go or not, or whether I'm going to have troubles or whether he's going to have troubles. Look how many pins are on this. There's eight pins on there. Either that guy's a damn good shot at a long distance, or I'm going to have trouble with him, and you're going to find out in a hurry. He's got a whisker biscuit rest. In my opinion, that's the best rest in all hunting. Nothing can go wrong with that rest. Your arrow can't fall off. You can't have malfunctions. There's nothing there to malfunction other than something can come loose. And if you put some Loctite on there and everything's been taken care of beforehand, then you're not going to have a problem with that. But I can tell that's set up right there for hunting. That's my personal hunting bow. That's killed some huge animals. I killed my state record bull elk with a bow just like this. Set up just like this. If I see guys show up with a drop away rest and, and two or three pins, I know I'm going to have to get the animal, get them in really close to the animal, and I got to make sure that they're not at a weird angle or having it, or, or they're very proficient with what they have. But I don't like a drop away rest for hunting, and I feel like you should be able to shoot at least 60 yards accurately on deer and elk sized animals to be successful as a bow hunter. Now let's talk about some clothing. If you're planning to hunt for your limited entry hunt, you should pay special attention to the unit that you're going to be hunting in. You should know where you're, about where you're going to hunt. And you should buy clothing that matches the, the temperature, the time of year, the coloration of the, the background of, of the terrain features, and then you should have a little variation in there. And, and some be prepared with layers for, for rain or inclement weather, but you're going to want light clothes for the early hunts and, and a little heavier clothes for the later hunts and, and some, some uh, thermal underwear, some, some, some wicking type of uh, clothing in layers for cold weather. Or even, even in warm weather, your, your underwear, your socks and everything should be able to wick dry very quickly. In case you get wet, you can take it off, you can dry it out, you get sweaty, and you can put it back on and you can go. Nothing's more miserable than being either cold and wet or, or hot, too hot. Your clothing is way too warm for the conditions. You got on 800, you know, 800 grams of, of insulation in your boots and it's 86 degrees outside and you're trying to hike three or four miles to get into a good hunting area. Now, a lot of times I have guys ask me, they'll say, well, what should I bring for camos? What should I bring for camo? And I'll tell them, you know, if we're hunting out in a desert country, I'll say, you know, bring some, bring some desert, desert shadow. This is made by Kings. This is a nice, light, light colored, a good pattern for sage and, and, and some pinion and open country, more open country. You know, and if we're, if we're in a little darker train and the, the uh, mountain vegetation with the, the pines and, and the uh, lupin and the low ground brush and it's dark green and a lot of shadows and you know I might say bring some Sitka gear that looks like this or or some uh, real tree you know extra green or or something like that depending on the terrain but if you ask me what to bring and then you show up and it's something totally opposite or off the wall for your archery hunt, particularly I'm talking about, because in the rifle hunt, things are different. You have to wear orange. You can still wear camouflage, and I encourage people to do that. But it's not as critical because you've got a gun. You can reach out and touch something. But in the archery hunt, it's really critical to match, excuse me, to match your background to your camouflage.
and there's no reason not to do that. There's so many selection, so much selection of camouflage out there. There's no excuse to not have good camouflage. You can see the difference. This has got a lot of black and grays and dark greens, and this is more light greens and browns and grays and a little bit of sage colored blue and and there's a big difference in camouflage. And it can make a difference. Uh, I've seen guys, I've told them, you know, they've asked me what should they bring for a pack, and I say bring a you know a day pack if we're if we're hunting fairly close to camp and, and, and access and trailheads and things, or if we're going into the back country and we need a bigger pack that we can we can take parts of the pack off and put them back on and get our stuff in there. But if I if I tell them something, they show up with something else, or they get out of their vehicle and they got a pack like this, and you know, nothing's even in it yet. It's it doesn't it's not really a hunting pack. Their stuff's still scattered around the car. You're going to know right off. You're going to be using an outfitter. You're going to be a little bit concerned, maybe a little skeptical. You know, here's here's a good pack. This is my daughter's pack, and it's 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 ready to go. I, I can get in my daughter's pack, and I know she what she's got in here because her dad's <laughs> set her up. But she's going to have a headlamp, and she's going to have her skin and knife, and and her GPS, and and her extra jacket, her lightweight rain gear. Everything's going to be in here. It's going to be organized. She's going to have a couple of headlamps, extra batteries, and. Uh, and that's how your pack needs to be set up. This pack isn't really, really heavy, but if you get good quality tools and uh, organize your pack and be ready, and you, you step out and you're ready to go when you show up in camp, you're going to have a you're going to have a good hunt. Your outfitter is going to be enthused. He's going to see that you're ready to go. You're excited. You're organized, and he's going to have a lot more confidence in you. Um, here's another thing that I just like to see thrown away sometimes on hunts. I've had, I've had cell phones, I've been in the middle of stalking things with my client and been up on some big old bucks or a big desert ram and had one of these damn cell phones go off and I wanted to just rip it out of his pocket and throw it over a cliff. Turn your phone off and check it when you get in, when you get into camp at night or, or at the very least turn it off and put it in your pack. A lot of the areas we're hunting um, we don't have we don't have good service anyway. But if you turn these off, put them in your pack. You know, in case of emergency, if you have if you have service, you could use it. It's always a good thing. Some areas you don't ever have any service, and so you know you can carry it to take pictures or to do whatever. But please, if you're with a guide, um, one of my guides, or with me, turn your cell phone off and put it in your pack. It can ruin a good hunt. Get a good set of boots. You can see these boots. These boots are less than a year old. These are Danner Pronghorns. These are my favorite. Uh, I'm not sponsored by Danner or anything like that. They should sponsor me because I wear enough of their boots. But I can take a pair of Danner Pronghorns, and these are uninsulated. And I can put those on my feet brand new out of the box without getting a blister. And maybe that's just me, but, but these boots are very comfortable and they're lightweight, they're waterproof, they don't have any insulating, they're for early season hunting. They're not constructed to be indestructible like a pair of sheep boots where, you know, you're taking your life in your own hands and even if you don't get a sheep, at least you, you're going to come back alive and in one piece. But you need a good set of boots. I had a lion hunter, I had a lion hunter show up this year on a lion hunt and we talked about all the things to bring. I give everybody a, an equipment list. I told them bring a good pair of gaiters and a good pair of uh, mid-calf length uh, mountain hiking boots that are insulated with about 600 grams of thin slate, no more. Because we're moving a lot and, and your feet are sweat if you got too much but when you sit and rest or for glass or doing something, looking for a kill, your feet can get cold. 
And so that happy medium, well, he showed up. He showed up with a pair of boots like this. Showed up with a pair, I call them, I call them uh, sprinkler changing boots. The, the white tail hunters wear, wear boots like that to get to their stand without leaving any scent. But I'll tell you what, the first track we hit on the second morning, the line went across the road and up a steep little hill and up into the trees. And I knew we were going to catch that line. It was a full snow cover. It was a day and a half to two days old. So the scent was, you know, it wasn't ideal, it wasn't perfect, but I pulled old Rowdy out of the truck and he stuck his nose in the track, snuffed a few times, hit the next track, and brrrr, he opened and I, you know, he didn't go screaming out of there like if it just ran across the road a couple hours before, but he could take that track. And I said to my client, I says, we're going to catch that lion here. He says, get ready to go. So I turned old Licks and Star and Bell out there with him and off they went, following Rowdy, opening here and there, went up over the hill, went up over the steep hill. And shoot, it wasn't too long, and about a half hour later, we were all getting started out hiking, and the train switches started going off. As I was right, they got him. You're ready, you're ready, you got everything, you're ready, okay. We got to that first hill. Well, for the, we went off the road and down a hill, and he slid all the way to the bottom of the hill. That's when I knew we were in for problems. I mean, I walked down the hill and he slid down the hill. Every time he'd take a step, his feet would just slide. We got to the bottom, he made it across the flat. I walked up the other side where the dogs went, went across the creek and up the other side. And this guy, he couldn't get up the hill. He couldn't take two steps, he'd slide back to the bottom. He had no traction whatsoever. I spent three or four hours. And where this lion was treated, there was another canyon and then another canyon, and then there was a ledge, set of ledges, and I knew unless we did something, unless he got some different footwear on in a hurry, we weren't getting to that line. So I, he, he just refused. He says, I can go, I can go. I tried to help him up the hill. I tried to help him up the hill. Four hours later, we were on the next little level, and the lines were two more. The line was two more over, right, right on the edge, and then Another half hour, we were almost at the top of the hill. We should have been up two hours earlier, and the line got away in the ledges. I had to pull my dogs, catch my dogs, and take them back. And he had a hard time even getting back to the truck. So now that's a little extreme example, but I had given very specific instructions on what gear to bring and what to have, and, and uh, there was this miscalculation on his part. But those are the kind of things that can really mess up your hunt. Now, if you're doing it yourself, that's all on you. But if you're, you've hired a guide and now you're subjecting him, he's worked really hard to help you with success, and now you're subjecting him to your failure. And his success is your success, and the future of his hunting and the future of his success is based upon successful, happy clients. And so it's just kind of a snowball effect. And so... Talk to your outfitter if you're going to get an out outfitter and get good equipment. Save up your money and, and only cry once. Get good equipment. Get the things that, that will work. Do some research. It doesn't have to be the top of the line. It just has to be good, solid equipment that works and that functions. And, and um, you know, every little bit of help you can give your outfitter, whether it's glassing or packing your, your big elk out, or being in physical shape so that every time your outfitter stops to catch his breath, you're right there in his back pocket. Um, when he says, there's the elk, get ready to shoot, you're on it, you got the crosshairs on it, and when the elk steps clear of the brush, you hit him right there in the shoulder and he goes down. And there's no looking around trying to find him in your new scope that you don't never use before, you don't know um, exactly where it's shooting. I mean, you, you, I can tell you some things that just horrify uh, any outfitter, but over the years you, you learn a lot of tricks and I'd recommend to people that if if you can all afford to hire, hire a good quality outfitter to hire an outfitter 
and it's going to make your hunt a lot better. Listen to their recommendations. Put the burden of success on their shoulders. Listen to what they tell you to do. And be safe and have a great hunting year this year, 2017. It's going to be a great year. If you like the things that uh, I'm talking about and attempting to do to help hunters, please like and subscribe and share this video. Um, if you want to support us and help this project, you can comment and tell us some of the things that you would like for me to discuss, um, whether it's a type of hunting, uh, spot and stock, tree stand hunting, mule deer, elk, putting in for the draws. These are all things that I'm going to try to cover in due time, but if I get an overwhelming, if I get some responses that lead me in one direction, then I can easily talk about that. Um, you can support us by buying our some of our logo wear. We've got hats, hoodies, and um, some t-shirts. I'm wearing, wearing one of our logo hats, the record book logo. Also for sale, this is my own invention. I invented this in 2009, the year that I killed the state record archery typical bull. I was traveling with my shoulder mounts, my deer, my elk, my lions, going to different shows and I didn't really feel really secure in leaving my mounts inside even though they had security and everything. And so I invented a, a way to lock my shoulder mounts up. And I also used these in my home on my personal mounts. Uh, these will secure your shoulder mounts to the wall. This is the mule deer size shoulder mount. This is 1999. This is an elk, elk, moose, Afri African shoulder mount size game. And this one is, is $29.99. And anybody with a level and a screw gun can hang one of these on the wall and hang your, hang your uh, trophy on it. And that's guaranteed to never fall off the wall. It can't fall off the wall. Your trophy can't fall off the wall. It can't be bumped. It can't be stolen. And you'll have an added layer, added level of security and um, safety. There's a lot of people that, that over the years that have bumped taxidermy shoulder mounts. They fall off the wall. They fall on grandma. They fall on their garage floor, they fall on their car. Um, uh, it's a great tool for taxidermists. They can, lock up their, they can lock up your shoulder mounts while they're working on them. I've heard of taxidermy shops being entirely cleaned out by criminals that break in. And so this is a, an added thing and you can even talk to your insurance company. I've got a, a break on my insurance on my shoulder mounts, my trophies, because I have them locked up. I know a, a, a friend in California who lives near Tehachapi and he had a hundred thousand dollar, over a hundred thousand dollar insurance claim from a lot of his African mounts that rattled off the wall in a little earthquake and fell from a vaulted ceiling onto a tile floor. He had over a hundred thousand dollars in damage to his mounts. It would have never happened if he would have had a hanger like this on it. They, they just physically cannot fall off the wall. If they're mounted into a stud with the provided hardware and there's no way, and no way for it to fall off the wall. On top of that you can add a padlock to the top. I also have, a, uh, for the smaller deer, whitetail mule deer, and pronghorn antelope, I have a model that has a sliding ratchet lock on top instead of the padlock. And it's just, it, this looks really nice. You can't hardly even see these anyway, even with a padlock on here, because of the way the shoulder mount's designed. It's behind the head, and unless you really look, you're, you'll never see it. But when people do notice these, they're like, hey, what is that on there? I've never seen that before. Well, that's, it's a trophy headlock. 
and I've been selling those and, and marketing those and uh, they're slowly starting to take off uh, and that's one way you can help support this channel and, and um, so we can make more videos and spend more time in the field. Thank you.